Welcome to Kindred. This is Lisa Reagan, and today we're going to discover the global movement to give children the vote from John Wall. John is the director of the Childism Institute at Rutgers University and the author of the book Give Children the Vote on Democratizing Democracy. Before you dismiss this idea, John asks us to remember the violent historical protests and mindsets against giving women and minorities the vote. As John shares, these same patriarchal impulses are alive and well in the adultist foundation of democracy. In this interview, John will walk us through democracy's need for conscious evolution and integration of diversity in order to reflect people's lived experiences. Finally, we consider the worldview issue and how a kinship or an indigenous worldview honors children's sovereignty and prepares them from birth to participate in all levels of family, community, and social governance. In contrast, our dominant worldview separates childhood from adulthood, disallowing children the opportunities and orientation needed to form democratic societies. The need to bring a third of the world's population into the democratic process to decolonize and democratize democracy is, as John argues, greater than ever. Well, welcome, John. Thank you so much for coming to Kindred and talking with us about this fantastic book, Give Children the Vote on Democratizing Democracy. And as I said earlier, uh, not many books surprise me. This one surprised me. I picked it up and thought, wow, uh, that's not going to happen. And then I read it and thought, wow, that really needs to happen. So <laughs> well, this is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I appreciate you know, talking to me and having the chance to speak to you. Well, let's introduce you to our listeners. First, um, I'd like to hear uh, how did you end up in this territory? And and then how did there was a moment at a climate change in, a rally in Philadelphia that really set you down this path. So maybe you could just take a moment and tell us your story. Absolutely, yes. Um, <clears throat> well, my my in, work initially was in political philosophy, and I didn't do any work in children at, at the beginning of my career. Um, I just tried to think about the the ethical groundwork of po politics and and how that could be thought in a better way, and including democracy. Then I got into childhood studies and got interested in children and politics and how children are engaged in politics. I actually learned through a graduate student from India about children's parliaments, which is how I started thinking about children's engagement in formal politics as opposed to informal politics. And eventually these interests sort of coalesced into this idea, which <clears throat> I, I wrote a chapter about in an earlier book around children voting but, I, but, but um, not in detail. Um, just the idea that while well, voting is so central to politics and so many other marginalized groups have fought for the vote over, over history and it's been so important to them. Uh, so why isn't there discussion around children? And then what I discovered is that there is a discussion around children voting and, and has been since the 1970s, which I hadn't even heard of, even though I was working in a similar area. And not only that, they're, they're actually children's groups uh, arguing for children voting and protesting and suing, suing the courts to try and get it ever since the 1990s. So I just became intrigued by the whole thing. <clears throat> and then uh, you know, as I was beginning to put this book together, I happened to end up at this climate rally in, I believe it was 2018 um, in Philadelphia, where I live. Um, I, I thought it was a I, I knew it was connected to Fridays for Future movement, but I didn't know it was actually organized by them and by children and youth. Uh, so I just, I, I go, I'm, I'm very compassionate about climate issues. So I've been to going to rallies, but I, I, I was looking around and I realized that almost everybody was under 18 at the rally and the speakers were a combination of youth and um, adult politicians. And there were very few grown-ups like me around. And most of them who were there were with very small children. And it just suddenly struck me that not only was, was youth, of course, I mean, I already knew youth is a very powerful voice in the climate situation because they, of course, face its effects most squarely and most 
deeply, immediately and in the long term. But I hadn't really realized that it wasn't even necessarily the, the point to have adults there. Um, it wasn't like they were trying to necessarily convince adults of their position. It was that they had their own political movement that they were supporting each other with. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that was a, an aha moment in a way of realizing um, it's not the point. It's not that adults control everything. In fact, children have very powerful ways of going about things. And, and I'm talking about there were six-year-olds, seven, eight, you know, up to 17-year-olds. I'm not just talking about teenagers. Um, and so that also contributed to my thinking about voting because I think for me, one of the touchstone questions is, you know, why don't our democracies um, do much or have much urgency about probably the greatest threat to, to humanity there is, you know, which is the climate crisis. And we all know it's there. The science is very clear. Yes, there are opposing positions, but they're minority positions. And yet uh, our political establishment don't, isn't able to act, uh, and at least not with the urgency needed. And that's not just in the US, that's around the world. Um, and it occurred to me that if children could vote, that would definitely be a strong incentive in that direction. Because when you talk to children, climate is often the number one issue on their minds. Whereas when you talk to uh, adults, especially older adults who may not have grown up with the issue, it's not. Uh, you know, it, it takes a third, fourth, fifth, or sixth place. So that was, that was why that was very important. And that's why I started the book with that experience. So most ideas that seem preposterous at first are usually uh, feel that way because they're broken off from context. And you take us right through the history of democracy first uh, in the book and then into voting's role in democracy and the creation of uh, democracy, the evolution of democracy through diversity. Uh, give us the context because that was really what allowed uh, positioning of this idea and this thought to uh, take root and to, uh, by the time you're done, um, make not only perfect sense, but to seem urgent. Yeah, the history is one of the things that um, makes sense of all of this for me. And, and it was when stepping back and looking at the historical context that I, that I was able to get more perspective on the whole issue. And I think part of the reason for that is that we tend to assume today, at least in the US, that voting has always been the same. It's just that more and more people have got it. You know? and, but actually, as I argue in the book, uh, and this is why one of the early chapters is on history, the, the kind of idea of voting has changed pretty radically. Um, I mean, I don't, if you go all the way back to ancient uh, Athens and Rome and, you know, that maybe India and Mesopotamia, other places that had very ancient democracies. What, what I realized or noticed was that pe there was already voting. You know, aristocrats have always voted. In non-democratic systems, you generally voted within your family, you know, for, for your, for, on the policies that the clan leaders would come up with. Um, and that would be males, you know, of a certain age getting to do that. And what happened in ancient, these ancient proto, or these, these first ancient democracies was that they shifted voting from that to voting across a spatial region. And, and it wasn't that more people got the vote, it was actually just the same people. Yeah, actually, it ended up being fewer people uh, voted in a different way. They voted a, across Athens, for example. And the, the idea was to, to reduce clan violence that was going on at the time. Anyway, that's very ancient history, but then shifts occur in the Middle Ages and um, in early democracies in, in, in the Enlightenment and, and so on that, that bring in more and more groups for, for different reasons for each group. So if you think about the US, um, when, when, the, when the US became a country, um, it was only about 6% of the population who had the right to vote. And that was um, rich landowning men. Um, and, and it's very hard to get your mind around, well, why would 
the founders of our country thoroughly be convinced, as would you know all the people around them, you know, that voting should only be for rich landowners. You know, why not poor people? Why not women? Why not minorities? Why not all the things we now have? And you have to really stretch your imagination to think, well, what did they think democracy was um, in that regard? And it was very different from the way we think of it today. And basically, it was a, a gentleman's agreement uh, around how to organize their assets, that, you know, the commonwealth that they all paid taxes into because they were landowners is some, it w- was something that therefore they had the right as landowning gentlemen to, to direct you know, the policies of. And, and you can, I, I won't trace it all in detail here, but similar radical shifts occurred when the poor got the vote. And the first time that any country gave all poor, all men, all adult men the right to vote was, was only about 150 years ago uh, during the second French Republic in France. Um, and then, you know, minority men and then women, you know, what, what was the transformation that had to happen for both men and women because many women were opposed to the women's suffrage at the time. You know, what change in thought had to happen for them to, to start thinking, yes, actually, it's not just male heads of household who should vote, it's all adults who should vote individually. That was another radical shift. Um, and then of course, 18 to 21 year olds was a, a shift in the past 60, 70 years. So, you know, that just puts into context the kind of radical shift that always happens when a new group gets the right to vote. And so in the book, I'm arguing that a similar kind of radical shift has to happen now to to upend our assumptions that, of course, voting is only for adults and to try and think about democracy differently uh, if it's to be, you know, ruled by the demos or the people. Um, So the history helps us see how how much dem- democracy has changed over time and how much it s- still could change if we wanted it to. So the, the phrase in the book, deconstructing democracy's adultist foundation, that leads us into talking about the childism piece. Can you take us uh, for a moment through adultism and childism and how this plays out with uh, where we are now in the story? Yeah. Um... I mean, this this concept that voting is only for adults and not for children would be an exa- example of a, an adultistic view, um, meaning it's, it's normative in our culture. It's without question for the most part. That, you know, nobody thinks it's problematic. Um, and, and so it's built into the structures of how democracy works and also just in a larger sense, how our societies work. So by adultism, I mean um, the ways in which um, adult points of view get centered in in many different ways and children's experiences and points of view get marginalized or sidelined or suffer from discrimination and and bias. So um, childism is is sort of an attempt at an antidote to that. Um, the same way that, you know, feminism was developed as an antidote to patriarchy um, or um, critical race theory was developed as an antidote to racism. Um, uh, I I thought there needed to be a concept like childism to be developed as an antidote to adultism. And so what I mean by childism is is just the same analogously to feminism and things like that. Uh, What I mean is the empowering of children's experiences uh, in such a way as to change these assumptions that we bring to to, to, to our societies and lives. So in, in terms of voting, you know, what would it mean to think about um, children having a real role in democracies um, as opposed to just assuming that, of course, they aren't ready for that yet? And that doesn't just in- include that doesn't just involve thinking of children as like adults Uh, instead it's more radical than that it's actually rethinking democracy itself and even rethinking adulthood Um, just 
undoing that binary opposition between adult and child that of course it serves some functions but it it's actually um damaging both to adults and children in in some ways as well just like you know the the binary opposition between male and female you know, of course that has some meanings in certain contexts but it also spills out into into ideologies that that, are, that can be damaging uh, and, and harmful. Can you take us a little bit deeper into that territory? And I know we've talked with you on Kindred before about childism and uh, and you have the Childism Institute there, Red Gertz, that's doing tremendous work around this issue, but it's such a blind spot and because it's so normalized in our culture. Really like to kind of illuminate that a little more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, our, our institute is, is attempting to apply this concept of childism or, and as well as think critically about the concept of childism and across various different uh, arenas, both academic and, and activistic. And uh, childism is, is an attempt to combine actually those, those two, ac activism and academics. Um, and we've, we've, we've got work on climate issues, de decolonialism, racism, um, um, democracy, um, lots of issues, law, we've, we've been doing a lot of work in childish law. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the I, it came out of this, it, it, it actually grew out of childhood studies, um, which is this field of studies since the 19, late 80s, really, that um, wants to look at children as agents in the world instead of just developing into adulthood, you know, instead of just pre-adults. Um, and I've been fully on board with all of that, and it's central to my work, and I work in a child studies department, but I started to get a little bit dissatisfied with it because it, it, it seemed a, a little bit like the idea was, well, we just have to think of children as just like adults, um, and 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 then we will understand what what their lives are are, are like and, and all about. But I thought that 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 which is that's great. But the problem is that you can do that through an if you do that through just an adult lens, then you're actually missing a lot about children. So if you're taking the assumptions that we have in our societies that about why adulthood is more powerful and important than childhood. And then you apply that to childhood, you don't see childhood as clearly. So the shift I, I wanted to make with the term childism is similar to the shift from second wave to third wave feminism, from looking at questions of equality of men and women to looking at, well, the dif difference in women and how that difference forces you to think differently about gender overall, the, the whole question and bring in this marginalized perspective. So that's what childism is trying to do. Um, it's trying to, to say, we don't just need to treat children equally. We, we do need to do that, but we also need to, to rethink the, the ways we think about society as, as a whole in response to children. Um, so in other words, so it, you know, get, voting would be a good example of that. It, it, the question of children's voting is not just, are children just as capable of voting as adults? Um, the question instead is, why is voting set up in such a way that it's more adult-centered than child-centered? And how can we change that and think about it differently? Yes, I, I really appreciate in the book how much time you spend in trying to prompt the reader to just think differently, just mm -hmm. to approach issues differently and to look at the context. Um, it really uh, uh, is at the very least thought provoking, but you do have some practical suggestions for how this could look, how this could be carried out uh, with proxies and some other pieces. And then you mentioned earlier that uh, some of these ideas have been implemented uh, in other countries. So can you tell, tell me about that? Yeah, um, well, one of, the, one of the helpful things about taking a childist lens was that um, I, I didn't have to just argue that we should keep voting the way it is now, but but just simply give it to children as well. Um, 
uh, instead, I had the freedom to sort of rethink what voting might might be. And and again, going back to the history, I would argue that has happened over history. That the actual practice of voting has changed over time as well. Um, so I realized that if you just made voting ageless, just eliminate the age category of 18, that would, that would be fabulous and I would love for that to happen, but you would still end up with large numbers of children who would, would be um, effectively disenfranchised um, because for example, a baby is not gonna go to the voting booth and vote in the same manner that an adult does at the moment. Um, and even younger children, you know, are, are uh, 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 they can't go to the voting voting booth. You can't just a two year old generally can't just leave the house and go and vote or something like that. So, I started to think about what what is the current system of voting based on, and it's it's kind of based on this on a, on a sort of enlightenment idea that an individual um, decides all by themselves what do they think, and then they go into a voting booth and, you know, pull a lever or whatever, push a button um, or vote by mail based on just their independent ideas. And one of the arguments I've been making in, 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 in a broader sense using childism is that that's just not the way human beings are when you think about them from a childish point of view, that we're not individual atoms who walk around the world making our own personal rational decisions. We're, we're actually interdependent. And, and I am deeply interdependent that we, we depend on each other for our things at the same time as being our own individuals who, with our own distinct experiences. So this, uh, what I propose in the book is a, a proxy claim vote. Um, and, it, and I get a lot of flack for this in, in the childhood studies field um, for introducing anything like a proxy idea because it sounds a little bit like regression back into an old fashioned dependence model of children. But, but what I'm really trying to do is say, well, no, we're going past uh, just treating children like adults and thinking of all of us as, as interdependent. So the idea of proxy claim voting is not that it's just for children, it's for anybody. So anybody who um, is unable to just is, is unable to actually cast a vote for themselves can have a proxy do it on their behalf. And that in the case of a child, it would be a, a parent or guardian or whoever the legal um, uh, next uh, person with responsibility over them would do. And in the case of an adult, it would be um, a next of kin or legal guardian as well. So if you think about an adult with dementia, for example, um, or, or an adult with um, severe cognitive disabilities or, or an adult who's just abroad and unable to necessarily cast a vote. Um, the way it works at the moment in the US is that if, if, you're, if you have dementia, for example, which is a, a lot of the adult population, you, you're, um, some someone who you who you who is appointed to be your next, you know, your, your next of kin or whatever, um, can can sit down with you and you can tell them what who you want to vote for and they can fill out your voting you know, um, card and mail it in. And and if you say you know Abraham Lincoln, they they have to put that down and send send it in. Um, so I think a proxy idea would provide uh, the full population the ability to, to vote. And, and then you could claim your vote whenever you want. So if you're five and you say, I want to be able to vote, then you can just claim it. You can just go and vote. Um, in the US, we have a registration process. So you would have to register. In most countries, you don't have to register. You just show up and vote. Um, so how that would exactly would happen would depend on where you are. But the idea is that the vote belongs to you um, and you can claim it to exercise on your own behalf whenever you like. Um, and the, so the idea is that democracy is not about individuals trying to, it's not just about individuals trying to influence government based on their belief systems. It's actually about 
uh, pressuring governments to be responsive to individuals. So if a, if if a, if a representative knows that a parent is going to have some extra votes on behalf of their babies or young children or elderly family members or whatever it might be, they're likely to take those interests a little bit more into account when they make their policies. You know that it, it, of course the parents may or may not vote on behalf of what's actually in the best interest of their children. And people in general don't necessarily vote on what's in their own best interest. I mean, we don't even know what's in our best interest a lot of the time. Most of us don't fully understand everything that government does anyway. But, but the point is that um, when policymakers make policies and laws, they would have to think about um, everyone from babies to the elderly and not just prioritize the people they think are going to elect them or keep them in office the next next time around. So yes, there are many countries do have proxy votes of a different of one kind or another. Um, um, you can in Canada, for example, provide a, if you have if you're traveling, if you're in the military or if you're traveling abroad or if you're actually out in the territories fishing or, or whatnot, you can actually assign your proxy just to somebody else um, to, to make your vote for you. Um, you know, there, there are proxy votes in other countries for the elderly, where you can make a decision for them for their vote. Um, but this would be kind of expanding that concept more broadly. Um, the proposal I make is actually very similar to one that, that the German parliament considered in 2003 and 2008. Um, and this was a cross party policy paper that they came up with. And the idea was a little bit different because uh, parents would be able to choose when the proxy vote is, is or when, when the child can vote on their own behalf. And I, I think the child should make that decision. But apart from that, it's the same idea. The, the only, the only reason it didn't get, well, the, the objection that prevented it from getting passed was that in the German constitution, voting has to be um, private. Uh, in other words, it's required that the individual vote in private without anyone else knowing what they're doing. And it was felt that any proxy kind of idea would, would violate the constitution on that grounds. Uh, in the US, we don't have that constitutional we don't have anything in the constitution about voting. Um, we of course have the amendments to the constitution, um, but the amendments are not about banning anyone from voting. The amendments are about protecting, you know, people over 18, for example, from voting. So it could work here perhaps. So culturally in the United States, we're very far from this, uh, these original ideals of democracy, which were not carried out in actuality with the patriarchy, uh, the patriarchal foundation. But it feels like recognizing children and bringing them into the participatory process from the beginning would shift their perspective, hopefully, and and you know recognizing their sovereignty, uh, supporting their empowerment to be a part of the world around them, this direct path. Um, it seems like there are a lot of aspects to uh, as you talk about in the book, and and then the subtitle here, you know, democratizing democracy, that could happen on the other side of bringing children in um, into this participatory process from the beginning. Absolutely, yes. Well, it's interesting because we live in a in a time and place in the in the contemporary US where children are actually very strongly separated from public life. Um, and that would not have been true in our own historical past when children worked on farms and helped to run businesses and, and so on. And and it's not true in much of the world today either. Um, I mentioned earlier children's parliaments. Um, there are about 30 countries with children's parliaments and the ones that are in um, poorer countries uh, like uh, rural India or Bolivia or rural Brazil, they actually have a lot of power and they, they even could sometimes control parts of the budget. And 
Um, that's because children are integrated more into the public life in in many parts of the world. That you know that they're on the streets, they're working. Um, you know, they're often uh, they're often the heads of households, making the most amount of money and supporting everybody else. So we do suffer from this very strong sense in the U.S. where um, the public sphere is an adult sphere and the private sphere is a child sphere. And of course, women have, have escaped that um, separation and as, as have minorities through you know, when slavery was a, you were private property of somebody and therefore not in the public sphere. But children have not escaped that. And on the contrary, they've been more deeply thrust into this sphere. So yeah, um, there's, there's a sense in which um, ch children as political actors is something that we have to kind of re regain, I think, in, in this country. And, and the climate movement is helpful for that because it reminds us that as, as black, same with Black Lives Matter or gun rights movements or other movements in which children are very deeply involved, um, that actually, yeah, children are part of the public sphere, that they're impacted by policies made by government. They have opinions, you know, on, on these policies and they have a different perspective to bring um, as children, which you know, adults can't necessarily understand as well unless you actually hear from, from them. I don't know if that was your question or not. I, I lost track. It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's the shift that uh, the reader ends up making is uh, with your guidance to re-envision what it's going to look and feel like to have this, this next evolution of democracy, which again, going through the history, we're due. And yes. you know, one of my last questions here is we're due because democracies are failing right now. Uh, I, don't, I think that's because we haven't uh, stepped up to the plate and evolved. And uh, how you, you talk about this in the book, uh, uh, and, and this goes to the urgency of considering uh, giving children the vote. Uh, how do you see uh, giving children the vote impacting this rising global tide of authoritarianism? Yes. Well, it's, it's interesting. When I set out to write this book, I thought it was going to be mostly about um, children's competence to vote, because that's the main objection people have. And I do have a two or three chapters on that, uh, arguing about, about what, what is democratic competence really and why that argument doesn't make sense. But I ended up, as I wrote the book, realizing that no, the main argument is that children voting would improve democracies and societies and children's lives, of course. And so, I mean, children's lives is a little easier to see because they, they obviously would have the ear then of policymakers. Um, but in terms of democracies and, and larger societies, I, I realized that um, you know, we're not hearing from um, a third of the population or in, in the US it's a quarter of the population, in some countries it's half the population, but on average a third of the population is under, under 18. And so what does that do to a democracy when you, when you don't allow you know, that, that many people to, to impact policies? Um, well, it does the same kind of thing it used to do when you didn't allow women to, have, to impact policies. You, you just end up with worse policies and you also don't address important areas. Um, um, so, um, so, so in terms of, you know, authoritarianism, it's, it's, uh, we have, we, we, what, one of the things I, I realized talk, talking to people in the children's voting colloquium, there's, there's a scholar named David Runciman at Cambridge university as a historian. He makes the argument that democracies expand the franchise when they are undergoing crises, um, because it's the best way for democracy is to respond to crisis. So, so when you have an existential challenge to your to your to a democratic society, expanding the franchise is often the solution to that. And women's voting and other voting happened during crises of a, of a similar kind. And now we're going through a, a worldwide authoritarian crisis. You know, it, almost every democracy in the world, in fact, any democracy I can think of, is seeing a, a dramatic rise in authoritarian. Um, elements within them. Some of them are being taken over by authoritarians. Um, 
you, you think of you know Modi in in India, Bolsonaro in Brazil. I, I hate I don't mean to bring politics into this, but Trump is an authoritarian leader in our own country. Um, so this is actually an argument I borrow from my colleague Michael Cummings, uh, um, who 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 wrote a book about democracy and children as well. Um, but if you think about it, that if if we if you spend the first third of your life being told, well, you are not part of the public sphere, your voice doesn't count, we don't want to hear from you, you need to wait until you have something important, you know, the maturity, whatever that is, to participate in politics, then, you know, you're probably going to grow up for the most part thinking, uh, feeling less, uh, well, be being more susceptible to authoritarian uh, appeals, and also to being civ civically disengaged. Um, you know, people attribute young 18 to, to 30 year olds are not very engaged in, in democratic politics either, um, or voting proportionally. And that's usually attributed to, well, they're in college, their lives are changing a lot, and so on, which of course is true. But it also is probably attributable to to the fact that they've been told their whole lives up till then, you know, we don't want to hear from you. So get, getting involved is a, pro, it ha, it, there has to be some shift in, in your thinking to then start being a democratic citizen in a full sense. So I think if we gave children the vote, they will grow up thinking, yes, their the, the democracy does care what they think and the politicians are res responsive to some extent to what they believe and what, the, what their lives are like. And then they will grow up to be civically engaged, but more importantly, they they wouldn't look to some to authority figures, you know, uh, as much for for their ideas. Like it, as a child, you're told you have to look to your authoritative parents and the the people who have the wisdom around you uh, to tell you what to do uh, in, in in politics. Uh, but I think that's wrong. I think you, you actually have opinions and perspectives and valuable contributions from, from the get-go. And, and if you were told that by your society throughout your life, you would then, um, you wouldn't be looking for some authority figure to guide you out of the, the, the dangerous waters you're in. You would be more willing, more likely to think, no, we need to sort this out ourselves as people and sort it out democratically. So that's why children voting would democratize democracy. And it would actually, in, uh, um, well, first of all, of course, it would actually involve everybody. And democracies are, are supposed to be universal and equal according to international law and US law and other law, countries' laws. But, but in a more profound sense, it would be, uh, democracies would be things that everybody had a, a stake in or an ownership in and felt valued and, and valued members of. And this is more of an indigenous model, which is something we talk about at Kindred as well. Uh, what is best for the community is to bring children up from the beginning who are empowered and are going to inherit uh, what the adults are leaving for them. So they, they have to be brought along so they understand uh, how things are working in order to really, as you say in the book over and over again, democracy is supposed to reflect the diverse lived experiences of everyone. And we don't have that at all. In fact, mm -hmm. we have a huge barrier uh, uh, to that. Um, exactly, yeah. Uh, that's a great point. Um, I think that's actually really important because we don't tend to think of democracy in relation to indigenous communities, but um, but there are people who've suggested that pre that uh, societies that are not organized around um, uh, ex, ex, what what we think of as democratic principles, uh, but indigenous principles are, are in a sense often quite democratic because decisions are made in a collective way. And everybody's input is part of that collective decision making, which, which is democratic. That it that should be the point of democracy to come up with collective decisions. So I think that's a great point. Yeah. Thank you. And to help uh, children be relational, we're missing relational intelligence um, here. 
to you or missing so much. Um, but uh, the last uh, question I wanted to have, I just wanted to give you an opportunity. I'm sure by now our listeners have had a number of the, it's really nice of you to put all these, uh, the, uh, the questions that oppose this idea on a nice little block and you just clicked them off. You know, here, here you go. So maybe just take a, a couple of the big ones that you hear all the time and, and and let's discard those as we leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yes, absolutely. Um, and I do go. I do address them in detail in, uh, in, in the book. But um, I mean, the main one is children are not competent to vote. They're not capable of voting. They're not mature enough to vote or responsible enough to vote. Something like that. Um, so I, I, I spend a, a whole chapter going through that question and trying to in a certain sense, think backwards from, well, what is, what is democracy attempting to accomplish? And how do we work from what democracy is to understanding what then the competency would be uh, to vote? And I make the argument that the, the, in a democracy, the competency should be as broad as possible, and it only consists in three things. It's, um, it's be wanting to, um, have your voice known in politics. Um, it's uh, knowing that other people's voices are or might be different from yours, and it's knowing how to how to decide among the the, the available choices that you're given. I mean, which often are very simple: you know, Trump versus Biden, or some, something like that. But sometimes they're more complex than that. And and all of those competencies, I I, I argue, come down are encapsulated in wanting to vote. So if you want to vote, then you have those competencies already, and that's all the evidence you need. And that's why I argue that a claim vote is the right, is the most democratic form of vote. Um, um, yeah, so that's that's the biggest one. Um, people often think of children as being easily manipulable and influenced by adults and un unduly influenced by adults. Uh, but you know, my, my view is that we're all influenced by each other and you can't um, prevent people from voting simply because they might be influenced by other people. Um, we, you're influenced by your family, your community, your society, your background, all kinds of things. And this idea that people can be free of influence, and in other words, totally independent, is an old Enlightenment idea, um, which is not doesn't account for the, the reality of human life. And it's been used to keep women and minorities and other people out of politics as well. So I think that's a false dichotomy. Um, I mean, there's a strange one that I hear a lot, which I don't understand why people have this, but actually I probably hear it more than any others, which is it would be unfair if people with large families had more votes than people with small families or no families. Um, and, and all I can say to that is you could only think that was unfair if you thought that children shouldn't count. Um, like if you actually thought that, a, you know, a single person living by themselves should have the same number of votes or, well, sorry, a couple living by themselves should have the same number of votes as a couple with seven children. So two people equals nine people. And I just think those extra seven people who are who happen to be under 18 do count equally and should have it themselves. It should be one vote, one person, you know, not, not that. I think that that I get that question based on various kinds of biases. Uh, one of them is adultism. I think there's also a race and class bias involved with the assumption that people of minority races and lower classes might have more children and we don't want them having more say. No one would obviously say that, but I think that might be deeply ingrained in, in, in the question. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's other objections you think of. Um, those are the main ones. Uh, those are the main ones that is wanted to dispense with them. <laughs> yeah. Left. I know they're gonna be hanging out there. Um, yeah, so the, I guess the last place I always like to stop is uh, where, what can we do if we're interested in, in being a part of this conversation and a part of 
uh, any kind of movement. I know the Childism Institute is um, really doing extraordinary work and very well attended events. Uh, but what, what else is there that we could do? Yeah, well, there are actually groups uh, out there working on this very issue. Um, <clears throat> in the US, the National Youth Rights Association, which is a, a youth-led group, um, has been working on it for about 20 years and um, is, is quite active in um, uh, state legislatures, which of course is where voting rights are primarily decided in this country. Um, they, they've turned recently to focusing on votes at 16, which I actually think is a mistake. Um, I, of course, I want there to be votes at 16, but I think it's a mistake because that's taking adulthood as the model and just shifting it back a couple of years. Um, but they are, but they are involved in they, they, their official platform is to eliminate voting ages. So that's one place. Um, um, you know, our, our voting colloquium actually brings together a, a, a lot of organizations around the world who are working on eliminating voting ages, like uh, Kretze in Germany, uh, We Want the Vote in Germany, um, Youth Law, Aotria in New Zealand, um, Children's Rights Association, sorry, Children's Voices Association in Finland. There's a lot of groups, oh, the Amnesty International UK, is working on eliminating voting ages. Um, so there are, you can find them on our website. There's a lot of organizations involved, but I think more importantly is just talking to, to people you run into or talking to politicians or, or friends or, you know, people in leadership positions in, in, in local communities. Because what I find is it's an issue which most people have not thought about. Um, but after about 10 minutes, um, they find very interesting and, and they, they realize, well, actually, everything I thought about this doesn't really make sense. And, it, you know, and it's, it's, it ha it's ultimately going to have to be a grassroots kind of um, shift that occurs in, in people's minds, just like other voting rights movements were. Um, the other thing that's happening uh, is court cases are being brought. Um, there's one in Canada at the moment um, where, uh, and, and there've been others elsewhere. Um, and I'm working with uh, some, some lawyers here in the US to think about, well, um, what kind of, constitutional amendment or change would need to be made on basically anti-discrimination grounds to, to change voting, voting laws here. Um, or in other words, to lower the protection, you know, below 18 to ageless voting. But I don't think that's gonna succeed without uh, grassroots, you know, movement. So I think the kinds of things you're, you're doing at your organization, the, just the, the, the idea of thinking of children as empowered beings who have a real role in society, that's where it has to come from. And we have to change our perceptions of childhood uh, in, a, in a more you know, fundamental way before anything actually will happen. And, but you know, I'm, not, I, I, I'm hopeful about it. I, I think um, maybe, I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime or not, but I think somewhere is going to puncture this age, you know, this ageless boundary at some point. Um, and everyone's gonna realize, oh, the world didn't fall down and it's not dangerous. It's not gonna destroy democracy, but actually strengthen it instead. And then I think, you know, it'll be, a, 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 you know, it, it, it'll be a, a more easy to see that in fact, there's, there's all kinds of um, benefits to, to it as well. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I think these things tend to happen in, in a kind of um, stop and start sort of way uh, um, as consciousness gets raised and reaches a certain boiling point. I see your work as being so important to Kindred and what we're doing here with, we, we're looking at the metacognition piece with a, a lot of scholars and guides and the shifting away from, Rian Eisler calls it the, the dominator 
um, worldview and and uh, into a she's uh, you know calls it the partnership worldview and then we have four arrows who is a metacognition scholar um, also here at Kindred and he is uh, he has we have this great chart on Kindred that you can download for free and you can also buy it now um, that shows the lists of precepts of you know dominant worldview is what he calls it and indigenous worldview and it's basically this relational piece exactly what you're presenting. Uh, where are these ideas emanating from originally? Um, where are they coming from? There is a worldview that's based in relationship that is life affirming, that we can move back towards. And there are so many pieces uh, to deconstructing democracy and reconstructing it, as you talk about in your book. So this is so crucial and really important. And thank you so much again for everything you're doing, for coming and talking to us here. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. With our voting <laughs> coming up here in the U.S. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, well, thank you for having me. And I love the work you do at Kindred. And I absolutely agree, you know, that we, we, a, a more relational, interdependent uh, way of thinking about human societies is so much healthier and um, in, in necessitates having children taking a role in all of that. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me and talking about my book. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you.